so glad you are here. This is your first time here at Oakley Kids. My name is Miss Sam and I'm the coordinator for Oakley Kids. So if you have any children in your house, gather them around and we're going to take a few minutes and go over today's lesson. So can anyone tell me what this week is or maybe what next Sunday is? It's Easter! And how exciting is that that we get to celebrate Easter? So we're not a we are not celebrating the Easter Bunny. We're celebrating the day that Jesus rose from the dead. How awesome is that? Easter, you have to know a little secret. It is one of my favorite holidays. I love celebrating it and I love celebrating it with you. Even if it's virtually, we still get to do it. So this week lesson is brand new. This week and next week, it's the best day ever. So we're gonna celebrate it. You ready? Let's go. Hey everyone, today is going to be the best day ever. My name is Kaylin. And I'm Justin. We're so excited to party with you today. Before we can kick off the best day ever, we need to know who's with us. So everyone, shout your name on the count of three. One, two, three. Whoa, nice to meet you, friends. We're so glad you're hanging out with us today. To get things started, we have a super fun video. Here, check this out. was the best. What a way to kick off our day as we're building up to the best holiday ever, Easter. Now, you may be wondering why we're partying today when it's not even Easter. See, the thing is, Easter is an awesome day because it's when we celebrate that Jesus is alive. But when we're following Jesus, every day can be the best day ever. You bet. And we're kicking off this celebration the right way with the best game ever. So here's how we'll play. We'll show you a picture and there will be an Easter egg hiding somewhere in that picture. You will have 20 seconds to spot the Easter egg and then find something in your house that is the same color and bring it back to your seat. That's right. And don't worry if you missed the first one because we'll play three rounds total. Okay, here comes the first one. And time's up. Did you see that orange egg? Justin, what did you find that was orange? I found a basketball. Nice! I hope you're ready for the next one because here it comes. And time's up. That green egg was doing a good job hiding. Justin, did you find anything green around here? I sure did. I found these cool shades. Nice. Okay, there's one more egg to find. And here it comes now.
Time's up. Man, that purple egg was a little hard to see. Tell me about it. But I saw it and I grabbed this purple sock just in time. I think it's the match to the one I found last week. Well, that's good. Hey, that really was the best game ever, but I've got something that'll top it. Wait, are you talking about the best story ever? Of course I am. If you were here last week, then you've seen this story before. But listen carefully because you never know what you might see that you didn't notice last time. You guys check it out. This is the best story ever. When God created the world, he made people and he loved them very much. Out of all the people God made, he chose the Israelites to be his special people. They moved away from the land God gave them to Egypt, where an evil ruler named Pharaoh made them slaves. They were treated terribly for hundreds of years until God sent a man named Moses to rescue them. God used nine bad things called plagues to show Pharaoh that he should seriously let God's people go free. But Pharaoh kept saying no. That was until the 10th and final plague. God sent an angel of death to take the life of every firstborn son in Egypt. God told the Israelite families to prepare a special meal by killing their best lamb. And then he said to paint its blood above the doors of their homes. The families who did would be saved because the angel who was coming would pass over their homes. After that night, Pharaoh realized that God was in charge and let God's people go free. To the Israelites, it was the best day ever. God had saved his people and he wanted them to always remember it. So every year after that, God's people remembered the wonderful way he had saved them by celebrating a meal together and they called it Passover. But God's people weren't perfect. They sinned again and again. And since God is perfect and just, he had to punish their sins. But God didn't want the people he loved to have to die for their sins. So he told them to kill a perfect lamb and that its blood would cover their sins for a little while. But God made them the best promise ever. One day, he would send the Lamb of God to save all people from their sins forever so that they wouldn't have to keep doing this. Many years later, God kept his promise and sent his son, Jesus, to earth. A man named John knew God's promise was coming true. And when he saw Jesus, he said, look, the Lamb of God, he takes away the sins of the world. John knew that God sent Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice that would forever pay for people's sins. Jesus was an Israelite, which meant he also celebrated the Passover. So one year, he and his friends were making their way to Jerusalem, where everyone was getting ready to eat the Passover meal. The people heard that Jesus was coming, and as he entered the city, a huge crowd spread their coats on the road and waved palm branches. They believed that Jesus had come to save them, so they shouted, Hosanna, which means save us. At the same time, some Jewish leaders saw how much the people loved Jesus. These leaders didn't believe that he was God's son and felt threatened by his power and popularity. They made a deal with one of Jesus's followers named Judas, and he agreed to hand Jesus over to them in exchange for some money. It was now time for the Passover meal to remember how God had saved his people from slavery in Egypt long ago. So Jesus sat down to eat with his disciples. He thanked God for the bread on the table, broke it, and gave it to his disciples to eat. Jesus told them that whenever they eat the Passover bread from now on, they should remember him. Then Jesus thanked God for a cup of wine and said, each one of you drink some of it. This wine is my blood, which will be poured out to forgive the sins of many. When the meal was finished, they went out to the Mount of Olives to pray. That's when Judas showed up with a crowd of people ready to arrest Jesus. When they took Jesus away, he was beat up, yelled at, made fun of, and eventually nailed to a cross 
where he died this seemed like the worst day ever but what people didn't understand was that God had the best plan ever he was working these things out for good God allowed all of this to happen because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice the Lamb of God who was saving people from their sins forever after Jesus died they put his body in a tomb and sealed it shut with a giant stone but three days later God sent an angel to roll the stone away when he did everyone could see that Jesus wasn't in there some ladies came to the tomb and the angel said to them don't be afraid he has risen from the dead it was the best day ever the women were filled with joy and hurried to find Jesus's friends as they were telling the disciples all they had seen and heard Jesus appeared and showed them all that he really was alive before he went back to heaven Jesus told his disciples to go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone Jesus said whoever believes will be saved just as God had saved his people long ago from slavery in Egypt God had now saved everyone from their sins by sending his son Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice for all time because of what Jesus did anyone who believes in him and follows him can be forgiven of their sins Jesus is the best ever isn't that just the best God's plan to save us from our sins was the best plan ever and that's what we need to know today say this after me God's plan God's plan is the best ever is the best ever let's say it again God's plan God's plan is the best ever is the best ever okay we have some questions for you to think about the first one is when God's special people were slaves in Egypt did God have a plan to save them God knew everything that was going on while his people were in slavery and he had a plan to get them out yep and I love how they made sure to never forget what God had done for them by having the special Passover meal every year. Let's see if you can remember something else from the story. The next question says, God didn't want anyone to have to suffer and die for their sins. So what was God's plan to save everyone? God's plan was to send his son Jesus, who was perfect in every way, to take the punishment for the wrong things we do once and for all. Oh man, that was the best plan ever. Now let's see what our final question is. If God had a plan to save the world, can we believe that God has a plan for each one of us? Yes, the Bible tells us that God has good plans for each of our lives, and that means that God has a good plan for you. That's right. Now I'm sure it didn't feel like God had a plan when Jesus was being arrested and put on the cross, but as we can see, God's plan really was the best ever. Totally. God's plan is the best ever, but I've always wondered why Jesus riding on a donkey was part of God's plan. Have you ever thought about that? Actually, my friend, I have. Here, check this out. Why did Jesus ride in on a donkey? They call it the triumphal entry, which is basically a fancy way of saying that all eyes were on Jesus. So you'd think he could have found something more majestic, like a horse, or more grand, like an elephant. Well, here's why it had to be a donkey. In Jesus' time, donkeys were a symbol of peace. And Jesus is called many things, one of them being the Prince of Peace. So when Jesus rode that donkey in front of all the people, he was basically showing them that God's plan was to bring peace on earth in the best, most awesome way. And that's why Jesus rode in on a donkey. That is so cool! Right? Now what better way to celebrate the best plan ever than to sing the best song ever? I totally agree. Some of you may have heard this song before, but if you haven't, you'll catch on fast. This is a freestyle situation, so you can worship God in your own way, right where you are. Now, remember, worship is a way to say thank you to God for all He's done, like creating and following through on the best plan ever. So, when you're dancing and singing along, make sure your mind is thinking about God. That's right. Now everyone get on your feet and worship together. This is 
talks about how Jesus is alive and that's the best news ever. I'm so thankful that God had a good plan to save us from our sins. Knowing that Jesus is alive and that we are forgiven makes every single day the best day ever, no matter what's going on around us. Now let's pray and thank God for his best plan ever. Everyone bow your heads and close your eyes as we pray together. Father God, thank you for having the best plan ever to save us from our sins. We know that you have a plan for each of our lives, and we trust that you are working everything out for our good. Please help us to see how every day can be the best day ever as we trust you. Amen. Now go and have the best day ever, and we'll see you again soon. What do you guys think? Wasn't it so good? The best day ever. I love learning about Jesus and his life and all that he did for us, that he died on the cross for our sins and rose again so that we can have an everlasting life with the Father. Not just you and me, but everyone. That's why it's so great to tell people how much Jesus loves them. Okay, parents, I would love for you to ask your kiddos what their favorite part of the week was and maybe not their so favorite, just to start some conversation in the family. Also, this week we have a family lesson for you. So look in the comments, we have a link to our Google Drive and it's our family lesson. So cool, right? Family, I'd love for you guys after church service and worship with Pastor Bill and Miss Tiffany, I would love for you guys to then do your family lesson. And let me know, text me, let me know how it's going. Miss you, love you.
Father, we thank you that you are an all-knowing God, that you are an all-seeing God. Lord, that, that you know each of us by name, that you haven't forgotten, that you aren't shaken. Lord, we thank you that we can come together and worship you. Lord, even if it's in our own households, Lord, we ask that your presence right now fall on each household. Lord, search us, any distractions, Lord, anything. Anything that would come between, Lord, our true and undivided worship. Lord, that it is gone. Lord, we know that you are worthy of all our worship. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I'm caught up in this void. 
your joy, with your peace, Lord, we need you, we love you. Lord, we know there's nothing else. Lord, we just want you. Yes, Lord. Nothing else. I started to say good morning. Um, it's a little bit strange doing this even at a different time now being Saturday, um, but it's good to see you. Glad you can make it here. And I want to talk to you uh, and continue our message on chosen by grace. You know, I really want to talk to you about the importance of a remnant. I want to talk about three things, the identification of a remnant, uh, the importance of a remnant, and the impact of a remnant, so three I words. Approaching this week coming up, a week of passion, Holy Week, uh, we've set up and uh, have always had an expectation throughout lifetimes and generations uh, of what this week of passion has always looked like. Um, we've set up expectations. Even in the coming of the Messiah, it's always had a look and a feel to it. That hasn't changed in my lifetime, in my mother and father's lifetime, in my grandparents, my great grandparents and beyond. There has always been a Palm Sunday, an Easter Sunday. Now, whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant, during this time throughout history, there's an expectation of what the coming of the Messiah week looks like. 
the Passover, the, the triumphal entrance. And for thousands of years prior to Jesus's arrival, there were expectations there too that had been celebrated for generations as well. And I find that God is reminding us during this time to consider him. The people in the Old Testament times would gather for Passover and, and, and they were expecting that one day the Savior spoken of in the book of prophets would rise uh, as their Savior, their, the Messiah, the King. And they expected the King to, to maybe arrive seated on a giant chair being carried by servants or maybe adorned with gold and silver and gems with an elaborate robe and of some kind or maybe being pulled by a team of white horses. But there was an expectation of this coming time, whether tradition or biblical history. Tomorrow is Palm Sunday. And every Palm Sunday, we have a church service. We meet together, we have a time of worship, we hug necks, we enjoy the kids or our teachers or pastors giving a great message. <laughs> using graphics and praying and laying hands on each other and whatever those services have looked like over the past 2,000 years, tomorrow is not the way that it's ever been done before. And I'm not sure how you feel about that, but I'll share with you what the Lord has given me for this time, like right now. Welcome to my living room, by the way, to my home. I'm declaring Oakley Church that we are not uh, batters, we are hitters. There's some old sayings, uh, and uh, we'll get into that next week, uh, maybe during study even, but there are some just some, some, some old sayings that say, you know, it used to be like this, or this is how it used to be. Uh, tomorrow is Palm Sunday. It's gonna be different than any other Palm Sunday any other church could have ever planned. I believe it's a special uh, remnant. It's a special time. It's a special Sunday. And I believe that this week of passion and purpose that we're going to enter into, we're going to go Sunday night. Um, every, every day we'll have a scripture for you to, to be studying, to pray with us. And we're going to celebrate all the way up to Easter and including Easter and even the day after. And so stay with us in that. Uh, the, there are just some things that are just not going to be the same, but that's not bad news necessarily. Uh, in our way, it's encouraging to me. It's encouraging to me, and I hope it is to you, to see other people reaching out uh, to more people uh, who need hope. So be that hope in somebody else's life. But you know, there are many sayings, and, and you know, there's an old saying, if you were a baseball coach, then you, then you would know that uh, something you say to a, to a batter is um, one thing, but we call them hitters. And, um, and here's what you would say to a hitter. You would say, uh, think fastball, adjust curve. And that's just an old saying, think fastball, adjust curve. And that just means that you are, you are prepared for the fastest, hardest, roughest thing, toughest time. You are prepared uh, when that fastball is coming at you. You're prepared for it. But if it turns out that it's just a curve, you can always adjust for that curve and still hit the ball. That's kind of a baseball thing, but I would say to you, church, that we are hitters and not batters. Be prepared, um, have your provisions, and also be prepared to shout to the Lord. I wanna tell you that he's spoken through like many different examples in scripture about being the remnant chosen by grace. And we'll settle into one particular scripture uh, towards the end of today. Um, but first I'd like to give you uh, some to look into during your time when, even when you're off uh, this iPad or phone or computer you're looking at. Uh, do me a favor, read the book of Esther. Man, it's a good story. It's a, uh, it's, <laughs> for me, if you have my sort of sense of humor, it's a, a bit on the comical side of the way things develop throughout that story and the way things turn out for Haman, but, but read it for yourself. Just read the book of Esther. Many of you are looking for things to read lately. Um, but the book of Esther, it's an interesting story with some twists to it. And Esther is told something by Mordecai. 
Um, I'm having you read the story because I believe Esther is another example of God's chosen uh, by grace remnant who is faithful to make change in the world. And that's what today is about. You see, Esther uh, was an orphan child. Mordecai was her older cousin who took her in and adopted her and raised her as his own. Read, if you've read it before, you read through, uh, how do I say this? Read through the glasses of a story um, of the remnant who make a change in the world. Read it through those glasses. Does that make sense? Um, long story short, she becomes queen at a very important and pivotal time, and she uh, makes a very difficult decision, um, difficult but faithful decision. Uh, faithful because she, she stood up for God's people. Uh, difficult because she risked her life in doing it. I showed you all that to say this. Mordecai said something to Esther prior to her making a decision. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. You see, God will, uh, how do I say this? God will get it done. Uh, he'll save his people. If not through you or I, then through someone else. It's that decision we must make when we know that he's called us to change the world around us. By his grace, we've been chosen. Listen, church, by his grace, you've been chosen for something in this time. Yes, even in this like strange time and especially actually in this strange time. The second half, half of Esther, uh, the chapter of, uh, Esther in chapter four, uh, verse 14. It says, yet who knows whether you have, whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai says, sends a letter, they're, they're talking back and forth. And his response to that letter says, who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther, Chapter 4, verse 14. God knows that we, Christians, have been chosen and have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Maybe you got this, this thing that you've been out of church, you've been away from God, and you, you really you got, you got a word or, or a feeling. Or maybe you're here today, even this message, um, you're saying, I'm going back to the kingdom of God. Or maybe you, you've been here or somewhere else and have just gone to church instead of church going. That's pretty good, right? Maybe you've just gone to church instead of church, church going. <laughs> but either way, um, you're being watched by those who are curious. You maybe have a voice that you didn't have before. And maybe you've been chosen, maybe you, like Esther, maybe you've been chosen for such a time as this. So there are several ways to accomplish this mission that you're on or this new thing that you've been chosen for. But um, let, me, let me give you a couple points here. Number one, be aware of God's call in your life in every situation. Look for the purpose in the purposes of God. Look for the purpose in the purposes of God. By the way, it's okay, uh, and you're encouraged even to ask him to pray, pray, pray. Esther, before she followed through with her decision, she called for all the Jews to pray and to fast on her behalf for three days. I wanna to talk to you about three things. The identification of a remnant, the importance of a remnant and the impact of a remnant. So the identification of a remnant. We identified uh, who God had made clear were remnants uh, previous weeks, in the last couple, three weeks. Uh, we saw that in Isaiah chapters 10 and 11, um, there's a chosen remnant who survived the invasion of the Assyrian army 
In verse 11, uh, they're promised that one day they'll be brought back to the promised land. And in Elijah's day, as God had called out, thinking he was, that he, Elijah had called out to God, thinking he was alone, God reminded him of the 7,000 that he had set aside for his glory to follow the days of Elijah. And we saw in Romans chapter 11, verse 5, we've been there a couple times where Paul reminds us that God is still doing that today. He uses that example, as a matter of fact, in Elijah to tell us that even today he is still, he has chosen a remnant by grace. He's still setting his people in a position to not only survive trying times, but to be the leaders and the light in the darkness, hope to the hopeless, healing to the sick, uh, kind of remnant chosen by his grace for such a time as this. Some examples of a remnant, uh, and especially the meaning behind one, the woman who uh, pushed through the crowd in scripture. Not only t- not to hug Jesus, not to uh, grab him, she knew that it would only take a touch. If, if even just a, a piece or a remnant of his garment, just a small portion of partial definition of remnant as the definition in Webster's Dictionary Puts it. But what about David? Uh, he uses the remnant of a robe uh, from Saul cut off of his garment to show that powerful statement. That one little piece of cloth represented what could have happened. David himself would be considered a remnant. Uh, a remnant meaning a small group. Uh, among all the warriors that were there, even in the story of David and Goliath, he was the one who stood up for his God's promises. That's what we have to do in this day. Stand and call out the promises of God. Think about this. David uh, stood out there, had all his provisions, didn't have any weapons. Uh, He had his one thing, the sling and the stones. Uh, He brought provision to the place there. And so the two things he had was, was the provision that he came with and his voice. Uh, Jehovah Jireh is our provider. He's the one that provides for us. Our provisions go with us. Our provisions in this case stay with us as we shelter in place. We provide for our families. The other thing David had was a voice. And with his voice, he shouted out at that nine foot something tall man and said, uh, I don't know what, this is Bill paraphrase here. Uh, I don't know what you're thinking. Um, but my God, and I see David as, a, as sort of in the dem- definition of, of remnant. So number two, the, so the identification of a remnant. Um, let, let's take uh, uh, Esther in her situation. Uh, we learned the definition of a remnant. But let's look at number two, the importance of a remnant. Uh, we learned the importance of a remnant, uh, as we looked last week, the importance of going from um, having much to having little in a short period of time, uh, that'll remind us all the importance of uh, the remnant that's left. I know I used a strange you know, analogy for you, but, but listen, whether it be, to, <laughs> go with me, stay with me, whether it be toilet paper, toothpaste, or the last little bit of creamer for your coffee, or the special moments, um, the places, the people, maybe the people you've lost, or the ones who are close to you now even. Uh, most importantly, we learned that a remnant can be what is here, what's valuable, what's, what's, what's what we put major value on because we realize that uh, when we begin to lose things, how important they really are in our lives. Many of you are going through that now. I see throughout the week. Um, and by the way, it's so good to be able to talk with you during the week, during the week time. Um, let me just use this moment here to say um, to go, you know, when we put out those Zoom meeting, uh, Bible study time and that, and jump in with us, join us in that. It's such a good time to stay together and to be able to fellowship. 
I want you to know um, above all that's lost, remnant, whatever it may be, um, you know, the most important thing that we can arm ourselves with is God. Now more than ever, let's realize uh, together the importance of, of things, places, and people that we almost lost. Um, we hold dearer to ones once we've sensed loss. Or maybe you've, um, maybe you've slipped a little as it relates to the importance of having God in your everyday life. Uh, Man, can I encourage you right now to get that back, get that importance back right now so you don't, uh, you don't have to go without. You know, and I, I feel like the moment some of you get a hold of that or come back, you know, to who God maybe was special in your life at one time that you will be able to spread 10 times faster than any virus. The identification of a remnant the importance of a remnant, and the impact of a remnant. Man, I can't wait to get to this part uh, because here's one uh, of my all-time favorites in Scripture in the Old Testament. The book of Judges, chapter 6, a man named Gideon is faced with some challenges. Go there, turn to uh, Judges, chapter 6, read the whole thing when you get a chance, goes to six and through seven. The whole thing actually in, in that portion of Judges is some great series of stories. Um, so, so read that. But basically, uh, it's another time where God's people, uh, they've turned their back on him. Uh, the nation is unre in unrest and, and, uh, and God actually delivers them into the hands of the Midianites for seven years. And in verses seven through 10 of Judges chapter six, the Israelites cry out to God. God answers and sends a prophet to first tell them how they've blown it. After all I've done, uh, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna again paraphrase, I have it right in front of me. Um, and I'll read from there in just a moment. Um, but to paraphrase, they, they cry out to God, God sends an angel, and he basically says, after all I've done for you, uh, and all I've saved you from, pulled you out of Egypt, you still turned on me. Uh, but then in verse 11, it says this, and I'll read from this, God sends an angel to Gideon. And in verse 12, and the angel of the Lord, jump with me to verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. And although Gideon was not a, much of a man of valor yet, the Lord called him what he was about to become. I just say, we're going through these things. Uh, so number one, identification. Number two, importance. And number three, impact. If you want to talk about impact, God called Gideon really by who is he was about to to become, not by who and where he was at that time. That's impact, little side note. Gideon's reply to the angel, maybe he said what many of us would who have had a call from the Lord on our lives, but Judges chapter six, verse 13, I'm gonna read from there. Gideon said to him, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So begins a conversation where the angel says, go, you were sent by God. To which Gideon replies, but we're, so verse 15, so he said to him, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. So even after God tells him, go and I'll go with you, he still, he, he still, he still, he still needs confirmation. He goes on to set a fleece before the Lord. If you show me this Lord, then I'll do that. If you show me one more time, Lord, Maybe we've said that before. 
I mean, I'm sure I have. You know, Lord, show me that it's you. Show me it's you. So needless to say, this was already an underdog story and God's about to turn it in, uh, into a, he's about to turn it up a notch. Turn to Judges chapter seven, verse two. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So to cut to the chase, he tells the, the scaredy cats uh, that they can leave if they want to, if they're afraid, and about two thirds of them leave. So 22,000 of them leave. Now, I want to time off for a second. Just you've heard, maybe you've heard this story before. It's one of my favorite, as I said. But man, I have a lot of people, but even the people I have do not compare with the amount of people that the Midianites have. They're like locusts. They are, uh, they, we're, they got bazillions and we've got thousands. And so the Lord sees what he has and he says, hold on a second, you got too many to where you could actually claim credit for what I'm doing. Listen, God gets the glory. And um, this is how this is how this story this is how this story goes. And so about two thirds of them leave. Now he's down to ten thousand men against a bazillion, and it's no, uh, it, it, it's just not looking good for Gideon or his people. God says no. Uh, turn to verse four. He trims them again. Listen. There are many sermons in all of these steps along the way, but stay with me. Uh, this is a story where many have preached from, and I myself love to tear their story apart and give you all sorts of things. There's so many goodies in here. How God chooses these people, how God separates people, how God takes the scaredy, scaredy cats, scaredy cats out of the way, and how God has someone that would lap water a certain way and be aware of the surroundings and the world around. All sorts of lessons and and sermons in this in this one area of scripture. But let's just let's just roll because we've we. We've got a point to get to here. In verse seven, uh, or, uh, chapter seven, verse seven and eight, then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took, listen, so the people took their provisions and their trumpets in their hands and he sent them away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That's verses seven and eight. The identification of a remnant, the importance of a remnant, the impact of a remnant. Notice what they have. Notice what they immediately and only took with them. Their provisions, and their trumpets. I just wanna say in our current situation, let's make sure of two things. And as your pastor, I want you to be sure of these same two things, your provisions and your trumpet. Okay, so to wrap up the story of Esther, she was told that if she had not been summoned to go before the king, that she could possibly face death for going, but she goes anyway. Uh, first, she asks the people to pray and to fast for her for three days, and then she goes before the king, knowing that there's a possibility, basically she's risking her life for her people. Now, when she goes, the king tips his golden scepter to her, which means she can speak. He offers her the opportunity to come before him and, and say, King, this is what uh, is going on. This is what I need in my life right now. And the way this story turns out, uh, the, the very man who tried to have all her people killed is the very man who ended up being killed in the end. That's why I say in the beginning, it's a kind of a cool story uh, in that sense. But you know, there's a message here for us if we're gonna be the trumpet, if we're gonna call out people, we're gonna say, um, listen, we care about you. And for those who would be curious about us and what's going on in our lives, that we would call out uh, the trumpet of God. We would glorify him. That in this way, listen, you have been summoned by the king and you have the opportunity to go before the king uh, and to make requests on behalf of people. And we are here today to help other people to pray for other people, to go before the king with boldness 
and say, Lord, this is what, this, these are our needs. Uh, we care about people and we want to not only help you and provide for people, uh, but we also want to shout the praises of God in the process. Uh, in this time that we're in, we need to provide the essentials for our families. And if you're in need, please reach out. Reach out to the host down below on the Church Online, if you're on Church Online. If you're on YouTube, chat. If you're on Facebook, say something. Listen, uh, message us. However you can get to us, go to oakley.church. Uh, anytime and plug in there say I'm here I'm new here whatever your need may be if there's prayer there's something there um, we want to be sure that you are taken care of and provisions are met so if you need prayer uh, hit the I need prayer even down below on the church online provision Jehovah Jireh provision and your trumpet this represents the trumpet it, it represents the praising of the Lord who wins our battles. This is a this is a triumphant trumpet. This is a this is a time where they blow the horn for battle, knowing that as they go in, uh, they will be successful. They will be victorious. It's taken the place of any kind of weapon uh, mankind can build, and it shouts, "The Lord is our victory." That's what it shouts. We will remain, church, the light of the world, a city on a hill, hope to the hopeless. In this time we have, valuable time we have, we must impact the world around us. Be the trumpet for God during this time. Be the, be the good news during this time. Be the happy person during this time. Be the joyful person person during this time. Uh, be the one who speaks life into those around you and those who you are able to be in touch with here online. Our intention is not just to show up to battle, but to be conquerors. Not to be present in other people's lives, but to bring hope to other people. Not to just show up to bat, but to hit. Not to just actually even, but to hit but to hit a home run. Not to be just victorious, but to be conquerors. And not to just be conquerors, but to be, as Paul said, more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Listen, I, we've got to cut time here, and I really want to pray for you. Um, I also want you to begin praying for each other. As we met on Wednesday night via Zoom, I, I actually, we put it up on the TV screen right here and had all of your faces up on the screen. And, and um, man, it's so good to see you and it's so good to stay in touch with you. Would you do that with us? Um, we have ways, uh, many ways for you to stay in touch, many ways for you to stay in touch during the week and to continue studying scripture with us. Go to oakley.church, you'll see a page there, a card, and it says Bible study or online study, I forget what it says. Go there, click on that, and you'll see that we are in uh, just a teaching series, and there's a time there for you to even check in and answer the questions right there on the website. Nobody else can see, it's just yours. Um, do that, fill in the blanks, that sort of thing. Uh, make Take notes, and then towards the bottom, it just says to plug in your email address and hit submit. And once you do that, it will email the entire notes and your notes back to you so you can see them. Nobody else can see them. I'm not gonna grade them, anything like that. It's just a cool way for us to continue studying in God's word, um, not only for his provisions, but also that we would be uh, his trumpet in this time of battle. So God bless you, Christian. Um, and I just wanna pray for you before we go. Father, I just thank you, Lord. Thank you that we have opportunities like this to reach people. I thank you, Lord, that we have opportunities to, to continue to communicate as a community and continue to not only provide for our families in this shelter in place time, but also, Lord, to have that trumpet, um, to have uh, provision here and a voice in other people's lives. So Lord, we pray that every opportunity to voice who you are 
that would come up, that, Lord, we would be not only prepared, um, but victorious. And not only conquerors over what the enemy is trying to do here, but more than conquerors over him and his ways. And God, we pray for healing, that it would spread, and that your love would spread from house to house and place to place. We give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. See you soon.